Hi, my name is Larry Lucero. Welcome to episode three on Live Treasure. Today we have a special guest and his name is Professor Kevin Asano. He is also the president of the United States Judo Federation. He is also the head instructor of the Leroy Judo Club. He is also the 1988 Olympic silver medalist in Judo. He's also written a book called Step Onto the Mat, and I would highly recommend you read this book because it's about his journey as it becomes an Olympic champion. But before we have a chance to meet him, let's take a look at the Leeward Judo Club as both the adults and the kids are practicing there. switch, grab the wrist here, turn, switch into Juji Katama here. Okay. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, I want to introduce this to you, this calligraphy. This is a, a replica of the original that's actually in Japan. And the person who, who drew this is Matsumai Shigeyoshi. He's the founder of Tokai University. He's already passed away. But he wrote this in 1976. This was at the commemoration of their uh, juku, the Matsumai Judo Juku, Bosei Gaku Juku. And uh, he was a Christian. So he took this from the Book of Romans. And these kanji, this says, Nintai, which is perseverance, then Tatsu is character, and Kibo is hope. So in the scripture it says that actually there's another, uh, there's another word which is suffering. Suffering leads to perseverance, which leads to character, and which leads to hope. And so this is uh, the basis of what Matsumai Sensei believed in, that as you go through suffering, then you have perseverance. Then in perseverance, as you persevere through difficulties, you have character, you build character, and with the character comes the hope, the hope in the glory of God, or hope for a better future. So this is the, the essence of what Matsumai Sensei wanted to share. So it's something that I believe that we should all share in, or we should all have that philosophy as well as we continue in judo and as we continue in life. 
Good. Can I have your name, please? My name is Kevin Asano. Now, you're the head instructor of the Leeward Judo Club. You're also the president of the Hawaii Judo Incorporate and also the president of the United States Judo Federation. And you are also the managing partner of the Pacific Rim Legacy Group. But most important, you're the winner of the 1988 Olympic silver medal, Judo. Now, the real question is, it sounds like so many things you're doing right now. So how do you manage to do all these things at this point of time? I have very good uh, teams. So I, whenever I do work, I never do it alone. So for example, in my, my business, I have a partner and we have staff. In the Judo Club, we have about 20 instructors that help with teaching. In the uh, United States Judo Federation, we have an executive committee, very dedicated individuals. So it's, I don't have to actually do all the work. I kind of uh, bring everything together, help with the vision, and uh, move the whole organization forward. And of course, you haven't mentioned, but I also have a wife and five children. That's right. So right. I have a fantastic wife mm -hmm. who homeschools our kids and does a wonderful job. So it's, it's never just by myself. If, right. if I had to do it by myself, I would uh, stress out and I couldn't be able to do what I'm doing today. Now, you have three daughters of your own, right? And then you also have two other kids mm -hmm. that you adopted, is that correct? Yes. So we were in the foster program, the state foster program, uh -huh. and we uh, fostered about 10 children, and of the 10, two of them came up for adoption. So we adopted them when they were about one or two years old. So it's amazing that you take that responsibility to, to have an additional part of your family. Now, if someone asks you, what is judo, how would you describe that? I would describe judo as a an international sport and the, the literal meaning is gentle way or it's a way of using your opponent's strength to your advantage so it's a sport in the sense that it's uh, in the Olympics it's in a college level it's in all levels of society uh, in over 200 countries in the world but it's also an art you could say because it is it's not just about strength it's a technique it's about philosophy life philosophy so I would say uh, first and foremost a sport and secondarily also an art and a way you, of life how do you master this art in judo how do you I know there is tremendous you have to have perseverance you have to have stamina you how do you master it? I don't think you ever master <laughs> judo or anything in life for that matter. Right. It's an ongoing process. It's a, it's a journey, so you might say. Yes. And in fact, what we tell our, our young students when they become black belt or first degree black belt, we tell them that's really like the beginning of the journey in learning judo. And the, the top level is 10th degree uh, black belt, starting at the first degree. So. I don't think, just like anything in life, you never master it. You, ne you, nev you never become perfect, but you're always uh, seeking, you're always going for perfection. You know, when you're talking about master, and especially this day and age, we're talking about um, uh, how do you raise up your kids today, especially today where it's social media, internet, and there's so many visual things. Uh, it's tough to raise kids today. So how do you compare when you grew up versus today, is it more challenging to raise kids? I think it's more challenging. Like you said, you have all of these different distractions. I think life was simpler. Even when I grew up, if you compare it to the previous generation, they probably had a, an easier time in the sense of raising children. But yes, I believe it becomes uh, difficult in time with uh, technology, the internet, and all, all, all these different types of activities. Do you recommend uh, having judo as being part of a family as part of the process and having both the kids and the family grow in today's generation? Yes, uh, something like judo. What I like about judo is you, if you get the child from when they're maybe five or six years old, mm -hmm. you can work with them all the way through 18 and if they choose to continue, then you can work with them for years. So you're building relationships for possibly for a lifetime. And also, I look at it not just an individual thing, but it's a, a family affair. 
So for my family, we don't just look at it as activity for our children, but my wife is involved behind the scenes in the administration of the club, building relationships with the other parents. So it's really a time that we don't see that it's taking away from the family, but it's actually adding to helping the family grow. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, uh, an extended family with aunties and uncles mm -hmm. helping to raise the kids. You know, I'm going to uh, uh, what you call, when you grew up and, and you uh, was with your father, and this is your journey as, as you started being uh, an Olympian. Uh, at the age of seven, uh, your father was very supportive in, in being you involved in judo. Uh, he nick nicknamed you Tiger. Why did he nickname you Tiger? Just out of curiosity. I'm not sure if he was trying to encourage me uh -huh. or if that was an observation. Uh -huh. You know, just someone going out there with a, the fighting spirit. But that, that kind of stuck with me. At first, it's kind of embarrassing, right? You know, right, your right. dad calls you Tiger and says, uh -huh. you know, Dad, don't call me that. <laughs> but after a while, he, it's, uh, it's kind of like your dad saying that I see something in you. I see that fighting spirit in you. So that kind of carried with me along, that it stuck in my, in my mind, in my heart, that I need to continue to be the Tiger or have that fighting spirit. So that was the beginning of, as you've been able to go to matches to develop this fighting spirit as, as a young kid and everything. Um, your auntie gave you a very special coin, it was an Olympic coin. And on one side, uh, it had the five circles of the Olympic. And on the other side was Mount Fuji. And I presume that was the Olympic storm uh, in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very special to you, right? Yes, yes. it was. First of all, very precious, right? The a commemorative coin from the Tokyo Olympics in 1964. And that's when judo started in the mm -hmm. Olympics. So being a, a judo player and thinking, wow, I wonder if I could ever go to the Olympics. But I think a lot of kids, of course, have that dream. And, but, but for me, being that it was a foreign coin relating to the Olympics and judo, and of course, from my favorite auntie, it was very special to me. Did you ever dream about at that point in your life, ever dream about becoming an Olympian? I think that's the first time I thought about it. Uh -huh. That uh, I related judo to the Olympics. Right, right, right. And I right. said, oh, well, that, that'd be nice. But I think of more of a dream or maybe a, a fantasy. You know, your dad mentioned one thing which I thought was interesting, that someday that you would win the gold medal for the judo. How do you say that? I don't know. In fact, <laughs> in fact, a few years ago, I asked him that, and, uh -huh, yeah. and uh, he—I don't think he was really sure himself. But, but later he said that he felt in his heart like God was speaking to him. Right. So, so he had, uh, obviously, I didn't win the gold medal, but I think it was just the words that he planted, as these seeds of thinking that, well, she, my dad, believes in me. I thought that's. When I, I didn't believe in myself, I didn't think it was possible with it. But when you know, when somebody that you respect, mm -hmm. you love, like your like your father, yeah. your mother, or your parents or a coach, when they say something, as a young boy, you take that to heart. And I think that was like the seed of thinking, oh, maybe I can, maybe I can go to the Olympics. That's pretty interesting that he would have this special observation that he really did believe in you, that you would have that uh, being a champion, being an Olympian. <clears throat> You know, you started high school in Pearl City High. Uh, it was known for its judo program. Uh, what was it like to train at uh, Pearl City High School? It was uh, an extension of our club, Pearl City Judo Club. Most of the people, most of the students that were at the club were also at the high school. So I think in the one sense it was very fun because you were working out with your friends and uh, at the same time, it was very, very difficult because we would train at the high school uh -huh. as a team, and then everybody would go to the club together. So it's like we would have double practices. And, and so it was, it felt like a, a, a brotherhood. Mm -hmm. So I think that helped us to train even harder. It was one of the best training judo throughout the state for that high school, true, right? I think at that time, mm -hmm. 
that most uh, clubs or or schools did not train uh, five six days a week. Now that had been going on for years in Japan and right. uh, places outside of Hawaii and the, uh, Europe, but I think for Hawaii at that time it was it, you didn't find too many people training five six days a week. So so I guess it was unique at that time. Now that's a lot of clubs will do that, but at that time it was I think it was something special. You know. It, in high school, uh, you attended a very special event, uh, a beginning for you to be exact. Uh, on that event, you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Can you tell me about that experience? Yeah, it was a Youth for Christ event mm -hmm. and, uh, in high school and a friend invited me. I had actually gone to church when I was in Okinawa. As a seven-year-old, a friend invited me to church, and then that's where I heard about Jesus. But then I went to this event, this youth, youth event at the high school, and there I heard about Jesus and how He's looking for us, that we're lost, and that he's, He wants to find us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And when I heard that, I realized that I am missing something in life. Up until that point, I thought my life was complete, that everything was going well. But, but when I heard that Jesus is looking for us, that He wants a, a personal relationship with us, I realized that that is something I need and that is something I want. So I asked Jesus to come into my life as a freshman. And that beginning was, as you could say, was, was always with you as you journeyed in becoming an Olympian, and even today. So my mindset changed from the day I received the Lord that it, I was continued to do judo but from that point on just something changed it wasn't something that I, I thought about doing but just something changed in my heart where instead of wanting the glory for myself I wanted to give all the glory to God through my judo so I think that was something a, a very significant mindset change from when I accepted to Christ to all the way uh, to winning the Olympics and even today as I teach judo. Sounds like a great experience. You know, um, every journey needs a good mentor and even a good coach. Uh, who is Larry uh, Iwamoto and uh, Fukushima Sensei? How did these mentors uh, coach help you? So Tsuru Fukushima was my first uh, sensei in Okinawa. I started judo in Okinawa. My dad was stationed there in silver service, and my mom wanted to get me out of the way, I guess, for summer. So I went to a judo practice, and Tsuru Fukushima was there uh, to teach me the basics. And after nine months, we moved back to Hawaii, and then I continued on. I had different sensei, like uh, Mayashiro Sensei uh, at Pro City Judo Club. And then when I got into high school, uh, Iwamura Sensei became my sensei. It's amazing that, as I look back, the dedication that he had. He, he trained us six days a week and it was out of his love and dedication for us. And I looked at, at someone, I'm about his age now and I look, can I dedicate it to the thought of dedicating or volunteering your time six days a week to judo, it's very difficult, even if you have, especially since you have your own job and you have a family. And then the good thing is that the Fukushima Sensei came from Okinawa. He, he retired in Okinawa, he right. came back to Hawaii, and then uh -huh. he became my Sensei again. So it's kind of like a full circle. As a freshman in high school, you won the national champion in your division. In the sophomore year, you competed in the nationals, but you lost by a controversial judgment. Your Sensei decided to send you to Japan for training. Now, did you ever been to Japan before, or was that the first time? Or? That was the first time to Japan. So being a local boy over here, you went to Japan. I bet you were really excited about that. Oh yeah, very excited. Of course, we didn't know what to expect, and there were six of us and our sensei went together. We went to Kumamoto, one of the top high schools in Japan. In fact, the most famous judo player, Yasuhiro Yamashita, uh, most famous judo player in Japan and in and, and the world, he came from that school. So, so you can imagine, a very wow. strong school. We were there for two months and we, we were thrown around like rag dolls <laughs> for two months straight. And, uh, 
uh, we were longing to come back home, but uh, that was a turning point where, where I realized what it takes to be a, a champion, to take it to the next level. You know, as far as the next level, there was a fork in the road uh, in the sense that you went to a five-day summer camp and you, you know, after you were really inspired to do some missionary work, but your dad insisted that you continue training in judo. Now, how did you know that it was God's plan for you to continue in training in judo? Because you really wanted to do missionary work. That's where your heart was. But your dad insisted and insisted that you actually return to judo. Yes, I went to a camp and I wanted to dedicate my entire life to God. And I mm. couldn't understand. I couldn't see how judo could play into that. I thought it was more of a distraction. So I actually... Uh, told the sensei, told my parents that I was going to quit judo and that I was going to actually a private Christian school. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And it was maybe about two weeks before the school was to start, my dad called me and he says that, that he wants me to continue judo. And I was totally against it. But I understood what it says in the Bible that we're to honor, to obey our, our father. Our father, and right, yeah. And so at that point, although I didn't agree, I chose to obey my father and I went back to judo and I told him I'll, I'll go back to judo but once I graduate from high school I'm going to stop and that was the agreement so that's what got me back into judo. So you respected your father's decision as tough as it was then right? Yes <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, was, that, that, was, that was very fortunate uh -huh. that I, I realize that as we honor our parents there's going to be a blessing that right. comes with it even if we don't agree. You won the 1982 Junior National Championship and then you competed in the senior competition at the US Open. You lost against Edward Liddy, one of your adversaries. Uh, you just, at this point you knew that you were against the big people, the, the most competitive people, and you realized that uh, you needed more training, more advanced training. You decided to enroll into the famous Tokai University in Japan for more advanced training. What was it like to attend Tokai University for two years to learn that advanced form of art? And I know it's another tough, tough environment. Mm -hmm. Toka University at the time and still continues to be one of the top universities in Japan which would make it the top university in the world. So many Olympian, Olympic champions and world champions come out of Toka University. And what they do is they recruit the best from all over the country. So it was very, I was very fortunate to be able to go to that because it's very exclusive. They only take a very select foreigners to come and train there. So I went there and uh, I thought I was going to do okay, especially being a champion, a junior national champion in the United States. I thought at least I'll be okay. But when I got there, it was a, a, a rude awakening because all of these guys were the best from their area and now one of the best in the nation and so I was literally at the bottom at, at the bottom of the totem poles getting thrown around beaten every day for two years for two years right yeah so it was it's it kind of wears on you psychologically right. emotionally right. you're thinking I want to go to the Olympics right I want to become a champion uh -huh. but yet you're getting beaten every day and then it kind of wears on you on you and you and I began to think maybe it's not going to happen maybe it's just I'm just fooling myself it's just a fantasy and I thought well I'm just gonna stick it out just to see what happens I can't quit I need to stick it out but it was very difficult at, at least initially physically mentally and emotionally you had, you had another fork in the road and uh, you we're trying to compete for the 1984 Olympics, but you came so close, but it seemed so far. Uh, before anyone can uh, compete for the Olympics, how does one become, uh, how would say, pick for the Olympics? There's a question on point system, mm -hmm. right? Back at that time, you had to 
qualify for the Olympic trials. And if you go to the Olympic trials and you win, the, the person who had the most points would be selected for the Olympic team. They chose five, five to go to the Olympic trials. I was number six, so right. I wasn't even selected to go to the Olympic trials. But you came so close, so close. I bet you were extremely disappointed that you put all this effort, all, you know, you went to Tokai University, you went to, you know, all this, all this, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. <laughs> yes, after training at Tokai and not even going to the Olympic trials, and I thought, well, maybe it's not going to happen. I don't know if I want to sacrifice another four years because I, I knew how difficult it was. I knew it wasn't going to be any easier. And so I thought, do I really want to do this? I thought, I gave it my shot. I did what I thought I was supposed to do or what I felt God was telling me to do. And I thought, well, maybe this is over. Maybe the, this part of the journey is over. I need to come back to Hawaii and continue back at the university, uh, get a job and, and continue my life as a normal person. So, so yes, I had seriously considered retiring after the 84 Olympics and not doing judo anymore. In fact, I to told my friend I was 99.99% sure that I would never do judo again, or at least I would never compete again. Right. But one night you went to a service and then <clears throat> somehow you changed your mind 180 degrees <laughs> that you was going to commit yourself again for another four years. And then that within that short time frame, you talked to a friend uh, about you know about if if he would have done it and the reason why uh, I think uh, if he had any regrets and I think that kind of reinforced it so was that the turning point for you to compete against the 1988 Olympics there was a struggle going on after I said that I was going to retire from competition there was still this tugging my heart that I equate now as I look back to God trying, speaking to me, telling me to continue. But I was struggling in my, in my heart because I really had no desire. But because that, that urge was so strong, I, I told God, I said, well, God, if you want me to continue, you have to change my heart. You have to give me a desire and a passion to do this because I have absolutely no desire to do that. And I thought that was a safe prayer because I didn't want to do it at all. And so when I went to that service, that evening service at, at church, uh, I was just sitting through the service and heard the, the speaker talk about world missions and nothing to do specifically with my situation, I thought. But after the service, it was like God poured in this new passion and this new desire that I wanted to do judo. And I, I realized at that time that my call, maybe as... Uh, as a missionary is a different way right. through judo that I could travel all over the world and I could share Christ with people through judo and uh, there was this passion and the excitement that welled up and I realized that this definitely is not from me it has to be from God and then the confirmation is when I went to a friend who was actually competing for the Olympics and uh, he decided to stop midway and I asked him if he ever regretted it and he said he regretted not going all the way and so I thought I don't want to look back 10, 20, 30 years and regret not trying right so I said okay I made a decision that I was going to continue and I moved to California San Jose State right. University continued judo there on, on and that's quest. where the journey begins for another four years of training yes you you went to San Jose State, and I understand they have one of the best judo training programs over there. Um, and what was it like uh, training at San Jose State? How, how do you compare that versus like in Tokai University versus being in California? Uh, how was the training? Was it different? It was different in the sense that uh, the team was smaller, maybe about 25. The coach was the 1964 Olympic coach, mm -hmm. and they had uh, uh, 
Olympic and world medalists that came out of San Jose State, so very good. They had amazing instructors as well, and I remember working out when I first got there, working out with, the, with a, one of the coaches, and he was in his um, late 40s. And I thought, oh, about my size. And I thought, right, well, right. I just came from Japan. I can throw this old man around. Uh -huh. and, but he grabbed me and he threw me all over the place. And I'm wondering, what in the world is going on? And, and other coaches, they, they threw me around. And we went mat work. And one coach would uh, choke me every day with the same choke. There's no way that I could stop him. So the quality of the coaching was fantastic in the sense that even though they were older, that they could still beat up on, they could still beat, beat me up. But at the same time, training six days a week together, you get very close with uh, your teammates. And uh, as you work together, uh, again, this camaraderie, the same mm -hmm. thing that I had in high school with this vision that we all had of wanting to go to the Olympics. So it was a, a great experience, very tough, long hours, but a great experience. Now they also stress academics. They don't want you to just to become champions as far as judo, but they want to make sure that uh, uh, you're successful after you graduated from college. Is that mm -hmm. true? Yes. In fact, the, the coach, uh, Yosh Uchida, was a businessman himself, so he knew the importance that you couldn't live off of judo. Right. So being at the university, we had to have a full-time uh, 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 load with our, our college courses and he said number one is school number one is getting your degree and then number two is judo but yeah that was that was an emphasis and as I look back that was so important because all of the guys that I trained with eventually graduated they, they had they had good jobs and they're successful today because of the emphasis on, on uh, school and most of them are not doing judo anymore and I, I hate to, to think what would have happened if they just focused on judo mm -hmm. and they wouldn't be where they are today in life. At this point, you're training for the Olympics and I'm, I'm assuming you're getting very close to the 1988 and it's the Olympic pre-trial pre and I understand one of you, your main adversary was Edward Liddy and uh, this was how I say the if if you won this match, then you would go on and become part of the the Olympic. It was uh, two out of three matches. You, um, let me see. Edward won the uh, first match, I believe, and you won the second. But the interesting thing now, this match was very critical because it was the last stepping stone to the Olympics. Uh, Tell us what you meant that you had won by 12 inches. Hmm. Well, Ed, Ed Liddy was an amazing competitor. He right. was a bronze medalist at the 1984 Olympics, the Los Angeles Olympics, so very tough. And uh, whenever we fought, the matches were always close. So as he said, I, he won the first match, I won the second, and it came down to the third match. And, right. And, uh, we started the match and he came in for a throw. He reached over, over my back and he did a sacrifice throw and he threw me and he got a score out of that. And uh, we both stood up and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is, this is going to be difficult to get, get that point back because he was such a tough competitor uh, in both his offense and defense. and so. I had to just try and focus because I was now behind. Right. But when we got back to the middle of the match, the, the referee stopped the match, he called the judges over, they had a, a, a conference, and they took away his point. And instead they gave him a penalty. Mm -hmm. And we were both shocked, we didn't understand <laughs> what it was. Yeah. Later on what, I, what I, I realized or I found out was that when he threw me, his body landed outside of the playing area and then he threw me so instead of getting the score because he landed outside of, out of bounds first that was a penalty so they reversed the score gave him a penalty and if if he were in only 12 inches more right his right. body would have been inbounds uh -huh. 
and he would have thrown me uh -huh. and he would probably have eventually won the match. Right. And so in that sense, just 12 inches made the difference between me going to the Olympics versus him going to the Olympics. Very humbling because when I look back, I says, well, it wasn't because I was such a great player. It was because of this instance. Instance. And, and kind of like God was telling me that it's not Kevin because of you. It's because this is what I want. That's why you're going. Not because you're so great, because, because you train so hard, because you're a superior judo player. So it's very humbling when I, when I sense that. It's amazing, isn't it? It's just, and that battle made, made it possible that you would become part of the Olympics team. Yes. When you, uh, I would imagine you'd have to do all the preparations to become, you know, meet up with your comrades and, you know, as far as uh, leaving from Hawaii. Um, what was it like to uh, land in Korea? Have you been in Korea or is that the first time? That was my first time. First time? And uh, what was it like to, to see Korea for the first time and, and land on there? Could you just believe that it's just amazing that you actually achieve your goals? It was like a dream. <laughs> <laughs> it was a dream then and it's still like a dream today. Uh, just to say, because you see that on TV. Right? Right, you see right. the Olympians marching and the uh, opening ceremony. And, and you think that's something that's unattainable. And then you realize that you are there um, at the moment. Right. So, so my goal when I went there was that I wanted to make sure that I had as much fun. I wanted to make this a celebration. Of course, I wanted to win. Uh -huh. I wanted to give God all the glory. Right. But thirdly, I wanted to make this a celebration for all the, the hard the training, the 18 years of training. Right. So those 18 years came down to that moment in time when you landed in Seoul then, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was incredible to be with the top athletes from around the world. Yeah. Again, very humbling to think that you're, you're chosen to be among this elite group of athletes. The best of the best. Yes. <laughs> and some of the hardest competitors that you have to compete against. Mm -hmm. When you walk into this Olympic Stadium for the first time and all the nation's best of the best and all the thousands of crowds cheering, how do you feel that moment? with all those people and all the, you know, hundreds of athletes walking into that stadium? There was both a pride, pride in the sense that I am here to represent the United States of America, and also a humility to, to think that me, this little Japanese boy from Hawaii, uh -huh. is standing here at the Olympics, uh, uh, humility to think that I would be able to be here. That must have been incredible to see all the fireworks and all the people cheering, uh, different different nationalities, and and seeing all your other competitors as well. It was just must have been exhilarating experience. Now, the battle begins now when you started uh, your match. In as, as far as trying to achieve the gold medal, you had uh, your first match was against Peter Sedovic from Czechoslovakia. Your second match was against Can Lee from Hong Kong. Uh, your third match was Sai Chuan Cheru from Taiwan. Um, did you think that you were able to make those three matches just out of curiosity? I mean, these are the best of the best. And we haven't gone to the semifinals yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was on the on-deck circle waiting for my mat, my first match, there was one mat and 7,000 uh, spectators. Uh -huh. And I was trying to calm myself down because I, I, for me, it's always the key to be relaxed and at peace and have a clear mind. So as, as I was doing that, I heard a voice in my heart so strongly and it said, the voice said, Kevin, you're going to do well today. And it was so strong. And when I heard that, it was like a peace went through my whole body. I was filled with this peace and this warmth through my whole body. 
and it was a very uh, emotional, spiritual thing. And I began to cry, actually, I began to tear mm -hmm. because of the sh what, I, what I felt was the presence of God there with me. And any fear left at that moment, and I was filled with the confidence that I would do well today. I didn't know what well meant, mm -hmm. but I had this confidence that I could go out there and that I could compete at my optimum. And that's how I entered into my first match. And so went to my first, second, third, and I was able to win those three matches. When you won that third match, now you're almost at the semifinalist, right? You're getting close to the main, as far as getting the gold and everything. But there was one person that stood between you and competing the gold. That, pra that person was uh, Japan's Hosok Hosokawa. Now, he was the captain of the judo team, and he was the 1984 gold medalist. Uh, did you think you'd win against him? Or, I mean, it would seem like uh, the people in Japan are one of the best judo people to compete against. Mm -hmm. But you compete against the captain, the gold mm -hmm. medalist. Mm -hmm. How'd you feel that you had to compete against this person just to get into the chance to get the goal? Mm -hmm. I had this, like I said, from, from, from this voice speaking to me before my first match, I had this confidence. So even though I had competed against him at the, the previous year at the World Championships and I lost to him, I lost only by a decision. Mm. So I knew that he was beatable. Mm. I knew that uh, he could not dominate me. So with that experience and also this, the voice of God saying that you would do well today, I, have the, I had this confidence walking onto the mat, I remember bowing and thinking to myself that I am going to win this match. So I had that confidence when we started the match. Went throughout the whole match, there was no score. And we, we went back and forth, we had almost, both of us almost had points on, e on each other. We almost threw each other, but there was no score. The match ended after five minutes. And at that time, if the, once the match ended, you have two side judges. Right. The side judges would, uh, would give their, their judgment on who they thought was more aggressive. We either wore a white or a red belt. And so one judge get, raised the red flag for a Japanese opponent. The other judge raised a white flag for me, and so the referee had to make that decision on who he felt was uh, more aggressive, and he gave me the win. So it was a split decision that I won the match by. And it was, literally, it was very, very close, almost to the point where you could flip a coin and e either side, uh, it would have been okay that either side won. So very, very close match. That was a close match. But I think what made the difference was the two years of training in Japan. The two years of getting beaten every <laughs> single day. And that made the difference from winning a very close match to losing. So, uh -huh. so it's, it's a life lesson for me. Sometimes when we think, why am I going through these weeks, months, years of, of hardship and difficulty? And sometimes we don't, in fact, many times we don't see that it's for the future. Mm -hmm. And in my case, those two years of training in Japan, getting beaten up, made the difference in that one moment that made the, the difference of losing or going for the gold medal. The final battle. This is where you challenge against the Korean Kim Jae-yup. Um, you challenge him, but in the, in the battle, uh, you're basically, again, uh, how would you say, both of you are aggressive, but there was a slight infraction, a minor point, where your hand, according to, uh, there was a controversial call, right? Uh, did you think that was fair, just out of curiosity? Well, it doesn't matter if it's fair or not. That's, that's the way it is in sports and life, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Life is not always fair. So you just roll with whatever happens. So he came in, he came in for a choke. He's trying to come in for a choke. Uh -huh. And I grabbed his hand like this. Right. And he pulled away and he kept coming in and he kept 
holding his hand and he kept pulling away and the referee gave me a penalty for that. So because of that penalty, uh, I ended up losing the match. I wasn't able to catch up and I ended up losing the match. And that's a penalty. fraction of a point, right? I mean, it's, yeah, this it's, is the smallest point. Yeah, it's the yeah. smallest point. Um, you lost by a mere fraction of a point from winning the gold. And at that moment, a photographer took a picture of you with your hands high up in the air in a, in a championship gesture that you had triumphantly won the goal. But tell me what went to your mind at that moment when you had won and lost the, lost the match. Well, why, why did you, at that time, uh, raise your hand up high? As soon as the buzzer rang, yeah. the match was over. Uh -huh. He fell to his down to his hands and knees. He was overcome with emotion because right, right. he won the gold medal. Uh -huh. And I started walking back to, to the starting line. And it's like uh, 18 years of training just flashed through my mind. And I thought to myself, and this happened in a matter of like a, a second, one or two seconds. So this was not planned, but I thought, I'm here at the Olympics. I wonder what it, I just want to see what it feels like to be an Olympic champion. Right, right, right. Because I had always pictured in my mind many, many times raising my hands, winning the Olympic gold medal. But, so I was here at the Olympics. I knew that this was my last match that I was going to retire after that. So in that split moment, I said, I'm just going to raise my hands anyway. But you were a champion, weren't you? Yeah. So when I raised my hands, yeah. I did feel like a champion because I realize and I recognize and this is what I tell our kids a champion is not one who always receives a gold medal or first place mm -hmm. a champion is one who realizes what his call is or his dream is that he steps out in faith that he perseveres through that that he does his very best of what he's capable and if he can do that if he does that then he's successful. He's a champion. And I looked at the, and I looked at my life. That's exactly what I did. So I could raise my hands as a champion, even if I lost in the gold medal match. That's very inspirational. I hope many young people learn from that. When you uh, receive your silver medal at the 1988 Olympics, and you were there at the podium along with. Uh, receiving the silver and you had a chance to listen to uh, the national anthem in the United States and the raising the flag how did you feel at that point? Well, it was a Korean national anthem. Don't, don't they raise the flag when? Oh, they raise the flag but they play the Korean national anthem oh. <laughs> because the Korean won, okay. won the match but uh, yeah to see the the US flag go up again oh. that, that sense of pride that I'm representing the United States. I'm representing Hawaii. I'm representing my family and my club. But uh, also, when I received the medal, I also looked up to say, thank you, God. I want to give you all the glory. So the same thing that when I was a freshman in high school, after I just received the Lord, mm -hmm. and I won the, uh, the high school national championships, I said, to the, uh, in a newspaper article, I said, I give God all the glory. At that moment, as I was standing at the Olympics, I said the same thing uh, 10 years later. God, I give you all the glory. It must have been an incredible experience just to be able to stand there, even just to receive a silver medal, and even just being that close and receiving the gold, just by technicality. Yes. Well, I was excited because, again, I felt like a champion. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I felt like I had the gold medal around my, my neck, mm -hmm. even though it was a silver medal. The next morning, you went to the Olympic Chapel. You prayed there for about 45 minutes. What did you pray about? I just prayed, and it was a prayer of thanks, thanksgiving, of thankfulness. Thanking God for helping me to per persevere or choosing me to, to go to the Olympics, choosing me to be a representative to share God's glory to, to the world. Mm -hmm. and, so, and also a time to thank the, the people who, who had supported me, other Christians who had supported me and prayed for me. You had a lot of support from all your friends, from your family. Now, 
The last thing, within that short time, you walk to a bridge over, like, overlooking the Olympic Village, and you were just admiring the sights over there. You closed your eyes, and you had a vision. What was that vision? The vision of a book. And there was a, a hand that changed the page, turned the page, and I saw that it was the end of a chapter and the beginning of a new chapter. And at that point, I realized that this is the end of my uh, competitive career. And now was, it was time to move on. And so, very emotional because mm -hmm. you know, after 18 years of training and uh, six, seven years of specifically training for the Olympics to realize that the journey is over. It was emotional, but also exciting to think, okay, well, what is in store for me next? Right, it's right, like, right. It's like uh, uh -huh. end of one phase of my life, but an opening of a, a whole new phase of my life. What kind of vision do you think the Lord wants you to do right now and, and for the future from where you're at at this point in time? I believe that God wants me to use my platform, which is judo, mm -hmm. to share the love of Christ with others. To help them to see again that, to help build champions and leaders in life through judo. So, so the experiences that I went through that I can share with the other people and ultimately to share the love of Christ with uh, as many people that I come into contact with. So I've been very fortunate to have a club here locally, a Leeward Judo Club in Pearl City and Waipahu and we're starting uh, another branch in Kapolei. Um, also to be able to be part of an, a national movement with the United States Judo Federation being able to meet uh, leaders throughout uh, the United States, mm -hmm. but also being able to go to Japan in the past year, I've, I've gone to Japan four times and, and uh, I'm going to go to Japan very shortly again, but again, going back to Japan, not as a competitor, but now as a sensei, as an official, to be able to uh, meet many people in Japan and have an influential, uh, influence internationally as well. Do you ever go back to Tokai University? Uh, occasionally, I'll go back to Tokai, <laughs> and then when I watch them, it's, I, I can't believe that I was out there. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing at the, their level of competition. Now that I'm older, my body doesn't move. I think, wow, that is amazing uh, what those guys can do. You know, along with judo that you, you teach with the kids and, uh, or the young adults, uh, you also teach a thing called the, the pyramid of success. And part of the pyramid of success, you also put in the different blocks some scriptures. Can you describe what the pyramid of success is? Yeah, the pyramid of success is uh, a system that John Wooden used. Who was, he was the UCLA coach. I believe he won 10 national championships. And I thought, well, if, if John Wooden used it, then if he was successful, then even if I'm one-tenth, <laughs> If I can have one-tenth of the success, then that would be good enough. So it's really, it's interesting that what he talks about success is the same philosophy that I have. It's having that peace of mind, knowing that you gave your best of what you're capable of. And so that's what he, he considers success. And that's the same thing that I said. Mm -hmm. that success is not about winning. It's about giving the best of what you're capable of. Uh, based on the talents that God has given you. And so he has building blocks to build this pyramid and these are different areas, for example, hard work, industriousness, enthusiasm, uh, loyalty, friendship. And so he has all these building blocks. So every day after practice, I'll share one of the building blocks with the students to not only just teach judo, because that's just one thing to just teach judo, just to teach a skill, but it's also to teach values and life lessons. And that's what I want to leave with them. Because someday they're going to go off and they're going to become adults. But I want to leave with them uh, character values. I want to be able to leave, leave with them uh, success uh, principles that they can take and that they can be successful in life as well. That's great. My last question is what advice would you give to any student any instructor or any type of advisors in to become successful in judo? I think f first and foremost is uh, make sure that you have that passion. Do you really want that? 
because nobody can put that in you. Find the passion on what you want to do, whether it's judo or any other sport, or maybe it's some kind of art, music, or whatever it is. Find out what that is. And then when you find out what that is, what your passion is, seek a coach. Because what I realized that in life that if I wanted to be the best, I always look for the best coach. Not only in, in terms of, of judo, but mm -hmm. in terms of life as well. Who can best help prepare me to become successful in life? So finding that right, that right coach. And then stepping out because it's very, it can be very scary to step out and, and to, to compete or, or to train or to find that club or organization. And, and I think the key is that life is going to be difficult. Training is going to be difficult. It's not every day you're going to wake up and say, right. I am so excited, I want, to, <laughs> I want to train, I want to work out. But having that heart, that perseverance, to, to, to whether you feel like it or not, every day step onto the mat. And if you do that, then over time you're going to, you're going to find yourself successful. Now, now, whether you win a gold medal at the Olympics or even go to the Olympics or whether you, you never win a match in your life, if you do these things, you can be successful. You can say that you are successful. Kevin, I want to thank you very much for spending time with me and answering all these questions and everything. And, and more important, thank you for sharing that journey. And I think uh, what you've said today will, uh, is important for both the young people and whatever age that we can learn from your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. We would like to thank Professor Kevin Osano and the Leeward Judah Club for making this event possible. Life Treasures is about people making a difference in our community and making a difference in both people's lives as they continue on their growth in their life. So until our next episode, we'll see you then. Take care.